In March 2001, this man met an engineer from Berlin, took him home and killed him. Over the following months, with his victim's consent, he dined on his flesh. It tastes like pork, a bit more harsh, substantial. It was a crime which shocked the world. One of the first ever cases of so-called love cannibalism. And it revealed a side of human sexuality that for most of us is unfathomable. My name, Armin Miles. I was born 1961. I'm computer engineer from Rothenburg, Germany. I killed a man, slaughtered him and ate him. Since then, he is always with me. On the morning of the 10th of December 2002, police in Rothenburg, Germany, made a surprise visit to this isolated farmhouse. They were acting on a tip-off from a young Austrian student. He believed that the man living here had killed and eaten another man and was looking on the internet for other willing victims. The police spent an hour and a half searching the house. In the kitchen, they found a freezer with a false bottom, concealing what the suspect claimed were packets of wild pig. But it wasn't wild pig. It was the flesh of this man. And in the garden were other human remains, a skull, bones and internal organs. Further confirmation of the grisly deed. There was no disputing what Mivas had done. He had recorded every bloody detail of the slaying on video. There are times in the video where I jumped. Most disturbing was perhaps the scene where the penis was amputated. As a man, it makes you jump. You can't stop that happening. You jump automatically. Or when he cuts his throat. You know then that that's final. You know that a person is dead. That's very disturbing. And the video was central to the prosecution's case, which they said proved that Maivas killed his victim for his own sexual pleasure. At a courtroom in Frankfurt in May 2006, he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. From his prison cell, Maivas gives us exclusive access to the story of what happened that night and explains how he was so tormented by demons from his past that he was driven to slaughter and eat a man. This is also the first time that a film crew has been given access to the crime scene itself. The house where Maivis slaughtered his victim and dined over a period of months on his flesh. You eat the flesh, a steak or a beef with red wine and potatoes and he, it was very important for Mr. Maivis to eat it. Personal photos and home videos, many of which have never been seen before, give a remarkable insight into the man who would become Germany's most notorious cannibal. If Hollywood's Hannibal Lecter thrilled you, the true story of the real cannibal will sicken you. Die bizarre Geschichte des Kannibalen von Rothenburg hat vor einem Jahr selbst hartgesottene schockiert. Lejos de España, el llamado caníbal de Rotenburgo va a pasar en prisión el resto de sus días. La justicia alemana. In 2000, Armin Maivas posted an advert on the internet. He made contact with Bernd Brandes, an engineer from Berlin, offering to sacrifice himself. They agreed to meet. It's been emailing and chatting on the internet since January and we talked about exactly what he would happen. Bernd had very bizarre ideas and guidelines how he had planned his end. When he actually stepped off the train I was nervous and excited. And then we are coming into the room where Mr. Maivis slaughtered um, 
Mr. Prandes. When the body is to be eaten, it has to be dead. That's clear. And Mr. Prandes put his uh, penis on the table, and Mr. Mayavis cut the penis with his knife. Then he was screamed horribly, but relatively short, maybe for 20, 30 seconds. It was a very a loud crying of Mr. Uh, Mr. Brandes, and it uh, after half a minute it was over. The blood was squirting from the open wound, similar to a fountain. And he was enjoyed when he saw um, when his blood is coming out of his body. He was enjoyed of it. It's, it's terrible, but there that that I have seen on the video. Maiver's life sentence will be spent here a high-security prison in Kassel with around 500 other prisoners. It is not, however, a prison for the criminally insane. Professor Bayer, a psychiatrist and expert witness at his trial, has gone on record to say that Mivis is not a danger to the public because he's in control of what he's doing. Armin Mivis was suffering from a severe sexual preference disorder, or so-called paraphilia, but was perfectly able to control his impulses. Armin Maivis is a very good example of a man who lived a double life. He went on sailing trips with his friends. Uh, he was a very normal neighbor. On the other hand, he was a monster in the media who was dining on human flesh. And the Maivis of the tabloids is unrecognizable to the people who know him. He was a dutiful son who looked after his sick mother until she died. It definitely wasn't easy for him to look after his mother, but he did it really out of love. Nicole lived nearby and became good friends with Maivis. He would often act as a babysitter for her four children. He often came and looked after the children. The children were always happy when he came and they had fun with him. I trusted him completely. And also, after everything that's happened, I would still trust him with my children any time. How did a man like Mavis become the cannibal from Rotenburg? And commit a crime so appalling that even today the footage of the grisly act is still too disturbing to show? And what about Brandis, his victim? What kind of person would willingly sacrifice himself to the perverted fantasies of another man? Armin Maivis had an uneventful childhood. He lived with his parents and two half-brothers in Essen. But most weekends and school holidays were spent here, in this house, in Rotenburg. We'd build tree houses, play cops and robbers and Indians, everything that was fun, or we'd chop down trees. It was lovely, really. Mavis was like most other children his age. A boy who loved animals and found country life idyllic. But when he was just eight years old, this idyll shattered. It was late summer 1969. Mivis was playing with the children next door when he heard his father drive off. Worst was the moment when my father left our family. My father simply drove away with a car. I was running after the car, wanting to stop him. I screamed. But he simply drove away, not even looking into the rear view mirror. That was a very traumatic experience for me. His two half-brothers also left home soon afterwards. Mivis missed all three of them, desperately. Now I was the only man in the house. And I felt myself responsible for both houses and for my mother. This burden, which I took upon myself, was a heavy one to bear. And I wanted to share it with a younger brother. I'd always longed for a younger brother anyway, because I wanted to share with him the love and affection that my older brother had shown me. But with his mother already 50, 
he knew that this was impossible. And after three failed marriages, she had no desire for another relationship. She completely withdrew. She was probably also worried that if she started another relationship, they would leave her again. When his father left, he also emptied the bank accounts. And for Waltraud Maives, it was a financial as well as an emotional struggle. She used to cry, and she didn't know how we were going to carry on. It was her nature to keep herself to herself. She didn't have much contact with anyone in the village. His mother lived in that house pretty much 24 hours a day. Waltraud Maives constructed a fantasy life for herself. She saw herself as Lady of the Manor, with her son Armin as her knave. They would dress up in clothes from medieval times and decorate each of the house's 36 rooms for visitors who seldom came. This is where Maive's mother lived. The room looks desolate now, but before it was tidy, clean and in order, I have to say. His mother was a very domineering woman, as far as I can tell, and from what Maivis has said. I think his mother controlled him, and Maivis was the kind of man who let himself be controlled by his mother. She forced him, really, and Maivis had to go along with it. She wanted what was best for him, but somehow she also ruled his life. She wanted him to fulfill her dreams. The young Maivis retreated into a fantasy world. His only consolation was an imaginary friend, a brother, who would be with him always. When he hit puberty, these feelings developed sexual overtones, and the imaginary brother became, for the first time, an object of desire, his first homosexual fantasy. The fantasy continued to develop, and over the years, I would add various other components. The boys were always people I found attractive, whom I imagined as my brother. He wanted to feel connected to them, that they should be a part of him. And then I thought that if they were to become a part of me, I'd have to eat them. Armin Maivis had always been a lonely boy. When he hit puberty, he had the same crushes as other boys did, but he found it difficult to form relationships. And these crushes developed into something more, the desire to eat someone so that they've always with him. Then he hoped that this loneliness would disappear. But there was never any question of forcing that upon his fantasy object. He had to go into this inner connection willingly. It wouldn't have been possible any other way. He had to practically sacrifice his life so that he could carry on living in me. That was how I saw it anyway. Armin Maivis shows a highly specific form of fetishism where the desire for attachment and comfort is achieved by contact to the fetish. In the case of Armin Maivis, the fetish is male flesh from a person he knows and likes and who voluntarily wants to be eaten by him. As a teenager, he had friendships with both girls and boys. But he was never able to free himself from his overriding fantasy that of slaughtering and eating a boy. It threatened to overwhelm him, until he made a decision which would change his life, at least temporarily. He joined the army. He was promoted several times. The men under his command trusted him and for the first time in his life, he felt himself accepted by his peers. Joining the army also meant that he was able to leave home and lead his own life away from his mother. 
His fantasies subsided, and for the next 10 years, he was barely aware of them. His loneliness was filled with a job. I think because he had a job to do, he, did, he was too exhausted and too busy uh, of thinking, uh, eating another person. While he was in the army, he even felt confident enough to apply to a marriage bureau, which put him in touch with a woman called Petra. The two started seeing each other and were, he claims, even engaged. But it didn't last. On the one hand, I wanted to be with someone, but I never found the right woman. And when the engagement broke down, I said to myself, OK, I don't need this anymore. Even as an adult, Maivis found it difficult to escape from his mother's domineering influence. She had this big house and dreamed of filling it with people, with life, of having a big family. It's probably also the case that she had a certain idea of what her daughter-in-law should be like. The woman Armin brought home, he always used to say, my mother always finds a fault with every one of them. Despite his best efforts to become a professional soldier, he never succeeded. Mivis left the army after 12 years and moved back home. To his mother. She never really recovered from a bad car accident she'd had in 1996, and Mivis became responsible for looking after her. I would scarcely have left the room when she'd be calling me in the office or banging with her crutches. Every five minutes she wanted something else. She wanted tea, she wanted soup or something. It was terrible. Three years later, she died. She'd had a heart attack in the night, and the day before she'd complained of a pain in her arm. I didn't think anything of it. I think that I gave her an aspirin. I brought her breakfast, as usual, and then I asked if she wanted to go to the doctor. No, she said, it's fine. I went to work as normal. I had no idea what was coming. In many ways, it was a relief. Freed from the constraints of looking after her and of being how she wanted him to be, he could do what he wanted. But it also meant that he was free to indulge his dark side, a side he had barely acknowledged, even to himself, for years. When his mother died, the last person uh, who, who kind of controlled him was gone. So he was alone in this huge house and he was completely out of control afterwards. He, he was in the internet every night and he had direct contact to more than 400 people in the internet, to other cannibals or possible victims. The internet had become a second life, a secret life. After the death of my mother, I'd had a good look at internet sites that had to do with death. And around this time, I'd somehow stumbled on cannibal sites, cannibal chat rooms. I took a good look at them and thought they were just fantasy. But there are so many ads, you couldn't believe it. There were people offering themselves to be eaten and were looking for people to eat them. It wasn't long before he answered some of the ads and met up with the men who'd placed them. My first meeting was with a cook. We created role plays and how I would slaughter and eat them. It happened often that we met in a hotel room. One of them even wanted me to label his pieces of flesh. I wrote down the names of the pieces of flesh on a slip of paper and pinned them to the corresponding body parts by using needles. This excited him a lot. When Mavis told me about the other people he met before Brandes, his victim, or after uh, his victim, I was really shocked. 
There were people which wanted to be barbecued like a chicken. There were people which uh, wanted to be hit with a hammer and then slaughtered. But none of them were suitable. None of them were willing to see it through. Then along came Brandis. Like Mivis, Bernd Brandis had also been scarred by events from his past. When he was five, his mother committed suicide. His father refused to talk about it, and their relationship broke down completely after Brandis confessed he was gay. Presumable similarities between Armin Mivis and Bernd Brandis were that as boys, both did not receive the emotional acceptance by their parents that one needs. I mean the feeling of being loved the way you are and not the way you should be. A kind of basic trust and acceptance. On the surface, Brandis seemed the successful businessman. But there was another side to him. He was a sexual adventurer. In 1995, he picked up former rent boy, Jimmy F., in Berlin's Bahnhof Zoo, one of the city's busiest railway stations. He wanted pain. He was really into pain. He wanted me to hurt him, particularly in the breast and genital area. But what he really wanted was for me to bite off his penis. He said to me, lay the knife against it. So I did that. I held it against him. At that moment, it excited him so much that he said, please, cut it off. Please, cut it off. Bernd Brandes wanted to sacrifice himself. A sacrifice is only significant if it is really something valuable. For him, it was a sacrifice of his genitals and his body. And this wish had become so enormously relevant in his fantasy world that it was no longer enough to just imagine it. Brandes offered me a sum in the region of 10,000 or more even. He offered me all his computer equipment, his car, everything in his flat. If, if I bit or if I cut off his genital area. He said, Manu, you just need to name a sum or tell me what you want and you'll get it. Bernd Brandes. I'd replied to an ad he put on the internet. The strap line was dinner or your dinner. And the text was, I'm offering you the chance to eat me alive. Who really wants it? needs a genuine victim. In Brandis, Maives had found the ideal victim. Someone whose fantasies provided the perfect counterpoint to his own. And while Brandis was a man who was confused about what he wanted, he was definite about one thing the desire to have pain inflicted on him. Together they would form a partnership so diabolical that today one man is dead, the other in prison for life. On the 9th of March 2001 at 8.44 a.m. Bernd Brandes took a train from Berlin's Bahnhof Zoo. Shortly afterwards, Armin Maives left his home in Rotenburg to pick him up at the station in Kassel. The, two come from the train arrived at 11.14, I think. And, uh, I was standing on the platform. He got off. He had a baseball cap on a dark shirt, a jacket and a pair of jeans. He had a plastic bag in his hand. We didn't talk much at the station because there was too much going on. Then we got into the car. As we drove out of town, 
He immediately began to start touching me. About an hour later, they reached Rotenburg. It had already been arranged in advance that Maivis would film almost everything that was about to happen. We arrived home and he went straight into the living room and undressed. So that I could admire dinner, or my dinner, he said. He came into the house with Brandes. From here, they went through the hall into the dining room. Then through the living room and straight into the winter garden. The winter garden faces the street. At the time of the deed, this terrible deed, the shutters were open and Brandes started to undress. He looked good. He had a sporty figure, as I'd imagined. He was a very nice, lovely man. Then the two came this way, upstairs to the second floor, to the so-called slaughter room, where later the terrible deed took place. We are coming to the slaughter room. There is the bed where Brandes and Maivis chatted, undressed and lay down. And then they played love games. Yes, we had sex because he wanted it. But he didn't enjoy the sex. He said, you can't do it, you're too feeble, you can't inflict the kind of pain on me that I want. He wanted to experience the ultimate high, and for him that was to be eaten alive. That for him would be ultimate bliss. At that point, because Maives wasn't able to rip the flesh from his body, Brandis decided to go back to Berlin. At the station, however, Maives claimed that he had changed his mind. They stopped at a chemist and bought sleeping pills and cough medicine. If Brandis was sleepy enough, he thought that Maives would be able to cut off his penis with a knife. They came back to this awful slaughter room. There's a hook in the ceiling where the, the body of Brandes was later hung from. In this area, these marks here show where a bench and the table stood, where he later laid out Brandes' body. Around 6.15 or 6.30 in the evening, he said, I can't stand it anymore. Cut it off. Then at some point, Brandes said, cut my penis off. Brandes uh, wanted to achieve the ultimate uh, orgasm, sexual orgasm. And he wanted to uh, destroy his own body. And his wish was to be slaughtered and that someone cuts off his penis. On, uh, we discussed everything beforehand, including the camera, which should be switched on because he wanted to see for himself what it was like when we did the amputation. But it didn't work. The knife wasn't sharp enough. And Maivis had to fetch another. The second time it happened relatively quickly. It only took a couple of seconds to cut it a few times. Then he gave the most awful yell. But not for long. Only around 20 to 30 seconds. Ow, ow, ow. Then he said, all I can see is blackness. I have to sit down. A few seconds later he told me that it didn't hurt anymore. He was astonished, because he'd hoped for more pain. He wanted to experience pain that was so bad it would kill him. Pain that would destroy him. 
Obviously, he yelled. He was standing at the table, and he sprang backwards. The blood was spurting out, and after 30 seconds, he stopped yelling and said, it doesn't hurt anymore. He felt no more pain, and he actually said that he was free from pain, and he was happy that the blood, horrible to say it now, was spurting out. He said to me, cut it in half. So I cut it in half with a knife and took both parts downstairs to the kitchen. First of all, I washed them and blanched them. It took a few moments for the water to boil. And then I seasoned it with salt, pepper and garlic powder and fried it for a short time. But the meat was so fresh that it shriveled up in the pan and wasn't really edible. I was relatively quick preparing it all. Because I thought that because he had such a massive wound, he'd uh, feel faint quite quickly. But he didn't feel faint, and he tried to eat it, and he was disappointed that he couldn't that it wasn't edible. Around 9 p.m., Brandis complained that he was cold. Mivis ran a hot bath for his guest and checked on him every quarter of an hour. He lay on his bed reading a Star Trek book as Brandes bled to death. He got into the bath, into the water, and was happy because the blood was spurting from his open wound, just like a fountain. After around two and a half hours, I heard that he called for me, and also as before, difficult as it is to believe, he was happy because he was lying in his own blood. Every now and again he poured more water into the bath, then he called for me again, and I went up. At that moment he decided that he would get out of the bath himself, but once he was out he collapsed, unconscious. Mivis claimed that he dragged Brandis upstairs, over the next few hours, he drifted in and out of consciousness. Just before he died, he is laying there, staring at the ceiling, and Bernd Brandes realized that this wasn't what he expected. So he died a lonely and unhappy death. And then so gegen Around half past two in the morning, I heard him stumble upstairs. He collapsed in front of the bed. Then he tried to stand up, collapsed again, and didn't regain consciousness. I hesitated for a long time. I prayed and even kissed him on the mouth. Then I picked up the knife, you can see it on the video. I picked up the knife and put it down again. Then I kissed him again, picked up the knife and lay it aside. I prayed. At that moment, I didn't know what to do. I asked myself whether I should pray to the devil or God. And I asked God for forgiveness. Then I took the knife, grasped it in my hand, and after hesitating some more, I cut his throat with it. When Mavis talked about um, the act of killing, it was difficult for him uh, to talk about that. Um, 
I think this was not part of his desire to kill someone else. It, it was hard for him to, to use the knife and to kill the other person. When he was talking about the slaughtering and the preparation of the flesh, he was very normal. Mivis knew exactly what to do. He'd found sites on the web on how to slaughter a human being and had been preparing for this moment for most of his life. Then in the slaughter room, after he was dead, I separated the head from his body. I hung him from the ceiling. Then I removed his organs and cut him in half. I poured hot water over the two halves and washed the body. In this fridge were parts of Brandes, which Maibis had removed from him. They were stored, frozen and from time to time eaten. You can still see the marks where it's been screwed down by the police. The flesh was secured, the flesh of Brandes, horribly enough, but this is where it was stored. He put it in the freezer, put in a false bottom, so that you couldn't immediately see that a man's flesh had been stored in here. Above it there was beef, pork, but underneath were the parts from Brandes. In the kitchen itself, it looks like it has always looked with the cooker, where he cooked normal meals, but also, of course, parts of Brandes. When he wanted to eat him, he needed the kitchen to prepare the meal. It all looks very neglected now, but before it was all very tidy. You can see, there's the cooker, Mm, the washing up. It was on this table that Maivis ate parts of Brandes. He took his good dinner service from this cupboard at the back here and put it on the table. He lit candles, took out a good bottle of red wine and prepared the meal and then he ate parts of Brandes. I had prepared the meal as a special occasion and uh, decorated the table with nice candles. I took out my best dinner service. I fried a piece of rump steak, a piece from his back, made what are called uh, princess potatoes and Brussels sprouts. Then, after I had prepared my meal, I ate it. The first bite was, of course, very strange. It was a feeling I, I can't really describe. I'd spent over 40 years, 30 years, longing for it, dreaming about it. And now I was getting the feeling that I was actually achieving this perfect inner connection through his flesh. Flesh tastes like pork, but stronger, more substantial. Although I don't think that other people would have noticed the difference had they eaten it. It tasted really good. Two days after Brandis disappeared, his boyfriend reported him missing. But Brandis had erased the internet files on his computer and there was nothing to link him to Mivis. But Mivis would become reckless. Over the following months, Mivis continued to surf the net. And he was keen to line up another victim.
In March 2001, Armin Maives killed Bernd Brandes, a computer engineer from Berlin. Over a period of months, he consumed 20 kilos of his flesh. Yet he continued to fantasize about eating a man. A man he knew and cared about. And was searching the internet for another willing victim. When a young Austrian student emailed to ask how many boys he'd slaughtered, Maivis replied, let's just say I've got experience. In any case, you wouldn't be the first. The student reported him to the police. Five months later, they turned up in Rutenberg with a search warrant. Six police men and women enter the house and um, they discover that there's a fridge. And there was a policewoman within the troop. And uh, she's, she asked Maivis, so what kind of meat do you have in the fridge? And I said, no, this is just normal animal meat. And uh, she looked at him and said, you know, I'm a housewife. I know that this is not normal meat. Along with a few packets of meat, which they removed for forensic examination, the police confiscated other potentially incriminating evidence. His computer, a video camera along with numerous cassettes, and three knives, an axe, and a butcher's apron. It was only a matter of time before they discovered the appalling truth. Later that day, Maivis called his lawyer, Harald Ermel. He called and asked if we could represent him in a case which concerns him personally. I said, we don't even need to ask. What is it about? He said, extreme violence. I thought at first, Herr Maivis isn't a Nazi. I didn't really take it on board because I couldn't see him doing anything like that. So I said, that's fine. Come and see us and we'll discuss it. And then he said, there's another thing. What? I said. Would you represent me if I'd killed somebody? I said, what have you done? And he said, I've killed someone. And I said, where do you have him now? In the freezer? And he said, yes. I killed a man. I cut his body into pieces and then I ate some of him. This was how our first conversation went. It wasn't long before the story exploded. He describes eating his victim as like taking Holy Communion. And Rotenburg, a small town in the middle of Germany, seemed an unlikely location for so exotic a crime. I said to him, it's going to be like a wave crashing over your head. There's going to be an uproar by the media. People will jump on you. They won't be able to understand what has happened. You'll need to go through all of this. He said he was aware of that. The case posed a problem for the German legal system. There is no law against cannibalism in Germany. And Brandis, as the video demonstrated, was clearly a willing victim. Due to the consensual nature of the crime, Maivis was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to eight and a half years in prison. However, after an appeal by the prosecution and a retrial, he was found guilty of murder. The video provided crucial evidence for the prosecution's case against Maivis. It proved that Brandis was still alive when Maivis cut his throat. Yet the video was so shocking that only 19 minutes out of four hours was shown to the jury. Most of the people who saw the videos were physically sick. Uh, they had to, uh, to, to go to the therapy afterwards because uh, it's not just about cutting flesh. It's also a very sad uh, film uh, because you know that one guy is, is dying and the way he is dying is so... it's just beyond imagination, I think. Whether Mivis regrets what he has done is debatable. I think regret is a too, too, too strong word for Mivis. I think he's starting to realize that what he did was wrong. And it's a slowly process. I did not feel that he really 
regret uh, the slaughtering and eating of Brandes deeply. I, I do believe that he regrets the killing. And for those closest to the case, there is still doubt about whether either man, Myves or Brandes, fulfilled a fantasy they'd been dreaming about all their lives. One of cannibalizing another man, the other of literally being eaten alive. These two men had a contract in a way that uh, Brandes wanted that Maivis cuts off his penis. Uh, this was not part of Maivis' fantasies. Um, the killing was not part of Maivis' fantasies as well. But of course it was the slaughtering and eating human flesh. Um, so um, it was for both, it was not what they expected. I've put the whole thing to the back of my mind. I try to remember the good days and the good times with him. And um, that's how I want to keep it. Today, I know that what I did was wrong. That this can never be the right way. The wishes, the fantasies you have that these can never ever be fulfilled and everything that you dream about will only ever remain a dream. What I did, even after I've done it, I always thought it could be more than just a dream. Today I know that it can never be. Our series on cannibalism continues at the same time next week with the cannibal that walked free.